for an introduction. Uh, welcome to my talk. Um, this talk is about bug detection and how to use machine learning in order to, um, to help with bug detection. And I'd like to start with an uh, observation about bug detection and the kind of techniques that we've developed in the past, well, decades uh, in order to find bugs. So the observation is that on the one hand, um, we have by now hundreds of different bug detectors. So they're very, um, um, well, usable tools, uh, like for example, Google Error Prone that look at your source code and try to find bugs um, in the code by basically looking for specific bug patterns. So usually these tools are implemented as a framework. You have this general framework, and then on top of that, you can um, implement checkers that each look for one particular bug pattern. And for example, just this Google error prone tool alone has more than 150 different analyses that each look for one different bug pattern. So that's the one side of the story. The other side of the story is that we have not only hundreds, but thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even more different bug patterns. And um, as you can see from the different numbers, um, all these existing bug detectors that we, that we have right now, unfortunately, miss most of the bugs that occur in the wild. And if you don't believe me, um, we have an ASE paper that was just presented a few weeks ago that um, gives some empirical evidence on that. But the bottom line is that the existing bug detection tools miss most of the bugs. And the um, conclusion that um, I draw from this, from this observation is that manually creating and tuning bug detection tools, unfortunately, does not really scale to all the different bug patterns um, that, that occur in the wild. So what can we do about this? Um, so the basic idea of our work is to, instead of um, manually creating a program analysis in order to find bugs, to learn how to find bugs by training a model that distinguishes correct code from incorrect code. So at a very high level, the idea is the following. We take two sets of examples of code. We take a set of buggy code examples and a set of correct code examples. And then we feed these two sets um, of examples into some machine learning model, which eventually gives us a classifier, which then, if you give it some new code, can tell us whether this new code is buggy or correct. And buggy and correct here um, is always with respect to one particular bug pattern. So I, at least so far, do not claim that we can train a general model to identify buggy code. But it's code that is buggy because it's, it's an instance of one particular bug pattern. Now, um, given this, this high-level idea, you may have many questions, like, for example, well, how do we get this training data? How do we get these uh, examples of correct and buggy code? And I'll give you an answer um, in a minute. You may also ask, well, how do we actually present the code? Because typically, machine learning does not work on source code, but on vectors of numbers. So we somehow need to turn source code into vectors of number, numbers. And I'll also give you an answer um, to that question. Um, before doing that, let me um, give you some context by um, introducing the kinds of bugs that we focus on in this work. Um, and these are what I call name-related bugs. Um, so essentially, a name-related bug is a bug that you can see as a human by just reasoning about the code given the identifier names that, um, that the programmer has chosen. So without really understanding what this code is doing, if you look at this for a few seconds or maybe half a minute or so, you probably see what's wrong in this code. Maybe someone wants to give a try and is brave enough to. Yes, right. So there's a function that defines two, um, two parameters, x and y. And then there's some variables that sound like x and y. And then this function is called. But instead of passing x first and y second, it's actually the other way around. So the, the bug is to have swapped the arguments. And without understanding what this code is really doing, by just looking at the names, you can basically see that it's wrong. Um, right. As a second example, um, let's look at this one. So. Um, Again, without really knowing what's going on and without having any information such as types, um, you can probably just by looking at the names um, have an idea what, what might be wrong with that code. Any guesses? Hmm? Uh, right, exactly. So this um, loop tries to iterate over, over params. Um, and j is the loop variable, which is a number. And params sounds like something that is, for example, an, an, an array. Um, so what the developer wanted to use here is params.length. And by just looking at the, at the names, you can see that this is wrong. Um, um, yeah, because, because the, the name that points to a number and the name that typically refers to an array or some kind of collection do not really match up. All right, so this is the kind of bug that we would like to find. And to do this, um, we're introducing this uh, approach called deep bugs, which uses uh, neural networks and deep learning um, to find these name-related bugs. Um, so here's an overview of how it works. Um, the input um, that we take initially is some corpus um, of code. And the first step is to um, automatically create a lot of training data from this corpus of code. So essentially, what we get out of this first step is um, the set of examples of correct code and buggy code that I've mentioned earlier. 
then of course we need to represent this code in a way that is suitable for machine learning. so in order to do this um we represent this code as as vectors of numbers and then have two sets of vectors um the correct vectors and the buggy vectors and these two sets of numbers are then given to a um to um yeah to to a classifier and we train this classifier and once we have trained it so that it's able to um accurately distinguish between correct vectors and buggy vectors um we can use it um on new code and predict um for the new code whether it's an instance of the bug pattern that we have trained the classifier for um so this is um yeah the overview of the approach i'm now going through these four um green boxes one by one and explain them in more detail so let's start with the first one um which is about um generating the training data so the idea to generate training data is uh, is pretty simple so we take um an existing corpus of code and then artificially inject um a lot of examples um well artificially inject a lot of uh, bugs into this code using simple code transformations um that that are very likely to lead to bugs so for one of the bug patterns um you've already seen an example it's this um this problem of swapped arguments um we simply take all uh, function calls in the code corpus and if they have um at least two arguments we just permute the arguments by for example just swapping the two arguments and this is i mean there's no formal guarantee that this yields uh, incorrect code but in most cases this yields incorrect code and if it's not incorrect in a few cases it doesn't really matter because machine learning turns out to be pretty robust um um with respect to noise um of course you can do the same thing for different uh bug patterns so not just for swapped arguments another one we consider here in this work um are wrong binary operators and again we um basically simply transform the code in order to introduce um artificial bugs so if, for example we have this binary operation where i is checked to be um less or equal to length which is replace the operator by some randomly selected other <coughs> other operator and this gives us some code that looks wrong if you just look at it and look at the names it it looks wrong um and as a third example um we also look at uh, wrong binary operands where we again start with some binary expression and then take one of the operands and replace it by some other randomly selected um operand that occurs in the same file the reason why we take an operand that occurs in the same file is just to have sort of realistic bugs that the developer could also have made so this gives us a lot of examples of um incorrect code and correct code and the next step is now to represent this code um as vectors so that we can feed it into into a machine learning model um the, the main insight for representing the code as vectors is that um natural language information that is embedded in the code in in form of identifiers actually conveys a lot of um uh, useful information typically program analysis to throw away this information and analyzing a piece of code that has meaningful identifier names and a piece of code that has completely meaningless names does more or less the same but in this work we do not throw away this information but instead really focus on the identifier names in order to do this we need some um way to reason about the names um that allows us to reason about the semantics of these names and to do this we um adopt an approach that is pretty popular in natural language processing namely word embeddings so the basic idea of word embeddings is that you want to have a vector representation for every word in your vocabulary in our case for every identifier name and you want to have um similar vectors for identifier names that are semantically similar and in order to do this we use a state of the art approach called word to vec and um basically just apply it to a large corpus of code in order to learn these um these embeddings what you get out of this um is something like this so you get um um a vector representation for every identifier it actually it's not just a two dimensional representation but a 200 dimensional representation so this is a projection that fits on a slide and what you see here is that um names that are semantically similar like container or wrapper um are close to each other so they have similar vectors or for example alert and message and error um are close to each other or here list and lst and sig so names that are typically used for sequential data structures happen to be um very close to each other so this gives us um a vector representation for every name the next step is then to um create a vector representation for an entire code snippet by basically concatenating the embeddings the vectors of the individual names that are involved in that code snippet so for example for the um bug detector that looks at swapped arguments we look at um at a at a function or method call and then take the um the embedding of the base object the embedding of the function name the embedding of the first argument and the embedding of the second argument and just concatenate them into one vector 
and in addition, um, we also use some other information. So if one of the arguments happens to be a literal, like a string or a number, um, then we also encode the type of that literal. And if we can resolve the function call, which is not always possible in JavaScript, um, then we also take the formal parameter name in the function definition, because that gives a good hint at what arguments you typically want to pass. Um, similarly, for um, the other bug patterns um, that both involve uh, binary operations, we, we, we do the, something um, very similar. So we again take the, um, this, this piece of code and look at the identifier names involved in the code. And then for each of the um, um, operands, we take the name and if it's a literal, also the type, plus some vector representation um, of, the, um, of, of the operand um, itself. And in addition, we also um, pass some context information um, that the parent and grandparent AST node type where this binary expression occurs, which is useful to, for example, tell whether this um, piece of code happens to be in an if condition or whether it's, it's maybe in a loop. All right, now given this, um, this vector representation, the next step is to learn the actual classifier, which is then, um, after training, able to distinguish between correct vectors and, and incorrect vectors. And the way we do this is to um, um, basically feed this, this vector that represents the, the, the code snippet into a, a standard feed-forward neural network, which in our case has a single hidden layer. You could make it more complicated, but we didn't really um, see a need for that. And then what, what this neural network does, given the, the, the vector representation of the code, is to predict a vector of size one, which is basically one number that gives us the probability that this code is buggy. And what we do during training is to um, train the network to predict uh, one for all the negative examples, for all the buggy examples. And we, and we train it to predict zero or something close to zero for all the positive examples that we know to be um, non-buggy. So it basically gets very good at distinguishing the correct code from the, from the buggy code. And then once we have trained the bug detector, um, we can eventually use it to predict bugs in previously unseen code where we basically use the same, the same network and now present, represent some new piece of code in the same way as before, feed it into the trained network, and then we get the probability that this piece of code um, is buggy. And um, we can use this probability, for example, to sort the warnings before reporting them to the user so that those warnings that have the highest probability are reported first. All right. Um, let me talk about um, our evaluation and our results. So we have implemented this, um, this tool for JavaScript code. The idea is more or less language um, independent, but it works particularly well for dynamically typed languages because in the absence of type information, um, identifier names are kind of the second best um, piece of information that we can use in order to find bugs. So we've done it here for JavaScript. Um, it's 86 uh, million lines of code. We use two thirds of that for training and, 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 and the remaining um, third for validation. What you see here is for the three different bug patterns that we um, have looked at, swapped arguments, wrong binary operators, and wrong binary operands, how many examples um, of, of code um, we have for training and we have for validation. And the bottom line is that we basically get millions of examples because we artificially inject these bugs and can do this very easily for a lot of code. And once you have millions of examples, um, these uh, neural networks usually work pretty well. Um, Here's the accuracy of the classifier. So this is basically um, what this percentage shows is after training for how many of the um, examples the classifier is able to make the right prediction to say that it's buggy or that it's, that it's non-buggy. And what you see is that um, it's close to 90% or more than 90% for all three bug patterns. So after, after training, the um, classifier is, is really good at identifying um, buggy code and at distinguishing it from, um, from non-buggy code. Um, apart from the, oh, okay, before showing more numbers, let me show you a few more examples. So this is actually an example from, um, from AngularJS, a popular JavaScript library, where um, the developers call this function uh, setTimeout, which is one of the built-in functions in JavaScript. And what you usually have to pass to this function is another function, which is then called after some delay. And what the developers did here is to pass these arguments in the wrong order, um, which doesn't do anything bad really in JavaScript because, well, it's the magic of JavaScript, nothing bad happens. Um, but it doesn't do anything good either because the function is not called. Um, so this is uh, an example of this first bug pattern where the um, arguments are swapped. Um, that's another bug we found in, in another JavaScript library. So what the code tries to do here is the following. So there's a loop. 
and then in the loop there's a function call and what the developers want to do here with this um, argument is to pass true, false, true, false, true, false, so basically alternate um, during the iterations and in order to do this what you would have to pass um, is uh, i modulo 2 equals 0 and instead the developers just flip the two, um, the two operands um, and, that's, and that's incorrect. And the reason why Deepbox finds this is because we um, not only look at identifier names, as I've explained so far, but also at, at literals. So basically, this, this value 2 is also um, considered by the, by the approach. And um, because it has seen a lot of examples where this happens, it knows that this is um, unusual and therefore flags it as a, as a potential bug. Um, so let me um, show you the, the precision of the approach, which um, basically means for how many of the warnings that it reports um, does it actually um, point to a real bug. So for um, each of these three bug detectors, we inspected the top 50 warnings, so 150 warnings in total, um, and then uh, manually classified it into either bugs, code quality problems, which means it's something that the developers want to change, but it's not related to correctness, um, or false positives, which is basically what we do not want to have, ideally. And what you see here is that um, 102 out of the 150 warnings actually point to something that the developers want to change, and most of them are, are correctness bugs, um, which overall gives an uh, 86, uh, no, 68 percent uh, true positive rate, which is pretty high, um, also compared to manually created bug detectors. And it's in particular um, nice to have this result because we didn't really tune um, the approach by yeah, adding some heuristics to remove false positives, but all of this is just learned automatically from, from the data. Um, one question you might ask is uh, how important these uh, vector representations of the identifiers are that we learn. Um, so what we could do instead, and we've tried this as a baseline, is to represent every identifier by a randomly chosen vector so that um, semantically similar identifier names do not have similar vectors, but they are just somewhere in the vector space. And it turns out that this also works, but not as well as, as using um, word embeddings. So if we, if we use these random embeddings instead of the, the, the actual learned uh, word embeddings, then the approach misses 11 out of the 102 um, true positives. And um, this is one of the examples that it misses, so that's one of the um, code quality problems. Um, the problem here is that um, the developer wants to implement um, a logical OR um, of these two functions called IS, and uh, instead uses um, um, a bitwise OR, which most of the time works fine in JavaScript, but it's, it's, it's actually less efficient than using uh, logical OR, and it's also error prone because um, it relies on an implicit conversion um, into, into, into a Boolean, which um, depending on what this is functions actually return may or may not um, do what, what a developer expected. Um, and the reason why this is missed if we just use random word embeddings is because in order to find this bug, uh, Deepbox needs to understand two things. One is that, um, um, is, is that uh, you should not use uh, bitwise or for, um, for two Booleans. And the other thing it needs to understand is that is uh, returns a Boolean value. And without the um, word embeddings, it, it does not know that is returns a Boolean value, so it misses this, um, this problem. All right, so um, in conclusion, um, I've presented debugs, which um, introduces this idea of treating bug detection as a learning problem, where we are essentially training a classifier to distinguish between correct code and incorrect code. Um, we've done this here in the context of uh, name-related bugs, so these are name-based bug detectors. Um, which um, have this, have this um, idea of exploiting natural language information um, in the code in order to detect bugs that traditional analyses have a hard time finding. And one interesting insight from, um, from, the, from the results that we get is that despite the fact that we only learn on uh, seeded bugs, so artificially created bugs, we eventually get a classifier that is able to find real bugs because the bugs that we have seeded are real enough in order to allow the model to generalize um, to, to real bugs. Um, of course, the, there are many, many open challenges, so I think this is just the beginning of, 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 of a line of work. Um, for example, it would be very interesting to try this um, kind of approach with, uh, with other code representations, um, not based on identifier names maybe, for example, based on, on graphs or any other kind of um, rich representations that we know in this community. And of course, another obvious um, line of extending this work is to, is to just cover more bug patterns. So, so far we have three of them, but I think the overall idea um, is more general than that. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions.
I had a question about the embeddings. Mm -hmm. uh, so identifier names are fundamentally different than words, you know, in the sense they have uh, camel case things and mm -hmm. are, have numbers often in them. So how did you deal with those issues or did you do anything special to deal with those issues? Mm, we did not do anything special. You could do that. So what's, what some other um, work is doing is to, is to split the names based on, for example, camel case. You can do that and probably that gives you slightly better embeddings. Um, what we here just do is we just consider the entire identifier names, no matter whether it's composed of multiple words, as one word. And this turns out to work relatively well and then you get for, for example, if you have a name get list and the name list, they happen to get very similar vector representations because the, the word embedding figures out that they are semantically similar. Uh, very nice work. So I have a question about the random embedding you compare. Is it like untrainable random embedding or is a trainable parameters as well? Can you oh, repeat it? Yeah, so when you use random embedding to do a comparison, yeah. is that embedding trainable or is this a fixed random embedding? It's a fixed random embedding and there's no embedding layer in the actual classifier. So, oh, okay. so, 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 so it's, it really just uses a random vector of representation for every name. So the every word name. embedding is, you, is uh, the parameter you trained instead of some pre-trained like, uh, for example, Wikipedia embedding. Ah, uh, so, so, so you could use an embedding pre-trained on some natural language yeah. corpus, but I think this wouldn't be the ideal approach because, because there isn't, I mean, there's some overlap between natural language um, documents and source code, but there are many terms in source code that are unique to, to code. So what we do here is we apply virtual embedding um, to the training corpus that we also use for the rest of the approach um, by basically um, considering um, every file as a sequence of tokens and, and then a token is like a word and the sequence of tokens is like a sentence in, in natural languages. Yeah, uh, I think one way people to be used to train starting from a pre-trained one and just fine tune on the data set basically. It's one way to. That would be another way to do it, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, uh, very nice work, very cool. Um, so I have two questions. Um, one is the more important question, so you can cut me off if you want after this. Uh, so were there any patterns or mutations that you tried that didn't work? Uh, and, and what were the nature of those, mm -hmm. if so? Um, so we've tried a few and discarded them at some point because the, the accuracy was not that high. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if I would conclude that they generally don't work. It's, it's just that, yeah, and we've, we've tried a few and then we, 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 we continued at some point with, the, with, the, with those that worked better. Um, so I'm not sure if I can. Well, if you could just give us a, a few, throw us a bone, like what details can you <laughs> give us? Uh, I have to. It's it's been a while, and we've yeah. So I think one one thing we've tried is to look at um, at assignments, um, and uh, which seems similar to, um, to 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 passing the wrong argument. Um, if you, if you if if the right hand side of an assignment is not the right variable, um, it should also be able to find that, and it 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 gets. Also, a relatively high accuracy, but not really as good as for the others. Okay. And then I had just a, a technical question on slide 16, yep. uh, where you presented the overall results. So I just didn't understand. Is this over the entire corpus of code that you uh, you checked against? Um, mm -hmm. so, okay. So this is the top 150 reports across uh, like a bajillion JavaScript programs. Uh, what, what we have this huge corpus. We use two thirds of that for training, and right. this is the top 50 over the remaining one third. Okay. Yeah. So what happens? Have you tried to apply this just to like like Angular, for example, or <laughs> some other particular framework? Um, mm -hmm. You know, have you tried that one on one? Because obviously. In general, people aren't throwing these things at you know hundreds of thousands of unrelated projects. So uh, I'm just curious what what it looks like when you yeah. apply it to a, a code base. Good good question. We haven't tried it. Okay. Um, I think what what would happen is that you have um, a relatively small number of bugs because these are only uh, no of warnings mm -hmm. because these are only only three um, bug patterns and um, the chance that one of these three occurs in a s one given small project is relatively small. Mm -hmm. But the in the long term, the idea would be to have many bug patterns and then you of course also find more bugs. Okay, great. Thanks.